I just started a recording um, so that anybody who wasn't able to make it can, can watch this later. Um, I have the top of that hour, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. Thanks for attending um, this session today. Um, just a second. Switch gears here. Okay, so I'll, my name is Julie Evener. I'm the Director of Library Services for the University. And uh, I want to talk to you today about our new institutional repository called SOAR at USA. If you were at the faculty retreat, some of this information will be the same, but I'm also going to do a deeper dive into some of the, um, some of the aspects that uh, might be a little bit more confusing or, or that I think people might need a little bit more guidance in, including the submission process and uh, a little bit more on copyright and um, using the Sherpa Romeo site that I mentioned at the faculty retreat. So um, it is going to be a deeper dive. Obviously, there's more time during this webinar than there was at the faculty retreat um, for, for this presentation. So uh, it will be, like I said, uh, some information that you've seen before um, if you were at the faculty retreat and also some new information um, or deeper, more, more information rather. So what is SOAR at USA? It's an institutional repository, or IR, which is an open access archive for collecting, preserving, and disseminating digital copies of the scholarly output of our institution's faculty, staff, and students. The URL is soar.usa.edu. Um, so I say on this slide, institutional repository plus plus, because the product and vendor that we've chosen, which is Digital Commons, is the product from the vendor B Press. We also have the software system necessary for digital publishing as a part of this. B Press started out as a scholarly publisher, and when they branched into IRs, they built their IR software on top of their digital publishing software. So it's all included. It's one of the reasons we went with this vendor. This means that in addition to SOAR at USA being a place for us to archive and disseminate work, it's also a vehicle for creating work. So for example, the software includes everything needed to run an open access online journal. Um, everything from accepting submissions to assigning peer reviewers to the final publication. There's also the capability to design and publish eBooks. While the library department is managing this repository, we really want everyone to consider it a university wide project. It belongs to everyone. We want you as faculty and other members of the university community to come to us and say, we'd really like to start this journal and we in the library will train you and support you, but you'll be the one, uh, be, be the ones who edit, edits and manages that journal. Um, so we're, we're not claiming ownership necessarily uh, or really at all of this. Um, we really want this to, to act and feel like a university wide project where uh, everybody feels um, included in it and everybody feels like they have a stake in it. So why is it good for our university? Uh, first of all, visibility and prestige. There's you know, no, no getting around the fact that it's great for marketing to prospective students and faculty um, as we're recruiting new students, as we're, um, I think, very important for recruiting new faculty members. We want to kind of show off and say, this is the kind of work that our university is capable of, that our students produce in our programs. And this is the kind of work that our faculty members are doing. And you know, they'll see that, um, that this is a place that, that they can go to do research and that they can go to produce this sort of output. It puts a focus on faculty research at USA. Um, for, for any faculty members who have been here a while at USA, uh, you, you know you recognize that this emphasis on faculty research is, is fairly new at the University of St. Augustine. I've been here nine years, and uh, you know it's really just been the last couple of years that we've seen this, this um, surrounding, kind of on all sides, this emphasis for faculty research. We've always had faculty that did research, but um, this emphasis is a new thing. And so this is a good way for us to continue putting that focus on faculty research and just another way that we're showing that this is important to us as a university. You can also provide information about faculty scholarship for accreditation reports. Um, I understand that uh, particularly with uh, CAPTI, they're now looking for in their accreditation um, 
reports, they're looking for a faculty member by faculty member listing of what sorts of scholarly output um, these faculty members are having. And so this is a way to kind of have it um, in, in one place uh, as long as the faculty members are uploading. It also provides a platform for showcasing student research and scholarship, such as dissertations. This is something we haven't had before. Our students who have dissertations, um, you know, they've done their dissertations and then that was kind of it. Um, they, they didn't really have a place to, to share those dissertations with um, the rest of the scholarly community. Um, and other sorts of student research, like research day posters, for example, um, can be can can have a longer shelf life now can can be more than just a, a one and done sort of a deal. Um, we can archive those and make them available to wider audiences. Specifically, it's good for faculty members because your research that you upload to SOAR will be discoverable and available publicly to inform other researchers. Um, for example, some of the places that people can search and find the work that's in SOAR at USA are Google and Google Scholar. Um, Digital Commons, the platform that we're using is, um, is, is, is known for its, um, you know, its, its algorithms to help um, get their, get, get work that are pu is published in a Digital Commons like SOAR at USA um, into Google results. Uh, it's, it's working, it works with those sorts of um, al Google algorithms to, um, to have these be available through Google Sites and Google Searches. Um, so that's one of the strengths of this, this product. Um, we're also working on getting it incorporated into Search USA so that somebody searching our own library um, search engine will pull up resources from SOAR at USA. And there's also something called the Digital Commons Network, which is uh, an open access. So in any school that has institution that has a Digital Commons platform um, Digital Commons Network is a place where they all converge and come together. So even before we had even um, really seriously thought about having our own institutional repository, the Digital Commons Network is a site that we uh, recommended on the library's website for people to go and search to find good open access content. Uh, also, studies show that research published in open access repositories like SOAR at USA is more visible and, more, and cited more often than research published in closed databases or presented once and not captured digitally, such as uh, research presentations. It, uh, it also helps to expand your, the reach of your work without expanding your workload. Um, again, uh, research posters is a good example. You create this research poster, you present it at a conference, and, and then nobody hears from it again, right? <laughs> and, um, and so this is a place where your research poster can live um, and people can go back to it. And people who weren't even at the conference would be able to access it. And your work has a lot more reach than just that one conference, for example. Also, researchers, researchers will be able to track downloads of your documents. So when you upload to SOAR, um, you have an account, we'll see that in a little bit, and um, you'll be able to pull up readership reports, see where people are downloading your work. Um, there's a, a cool map feature where you can see on a map where downloads of your work have occurred, what countries, what cities around the world where people are downloading it. So it's kind of cool to be able to track that. SOAR at USA is a safe and long-term way to archive your scholarship. Uh, you'll have a unique persistent link to your work. You can include that on a CV or a resume and uh, a, you know, a LinkedIn profile and be able to uh, know that that link is going to work for anybody who tries it. Um, it's not going to be, you know, they're not going to click on a link and then hit a paywall, for example, to see an example of your work. Um, it's going to be a unique and persistent URL that's open access. Okay, so now we're gonna go in and look at SOAR at USA. Excuse me while I transition. Okay. 
So this is the library's homepage, library.usa.edu, and I brought you here just to show that. Uh, let me refresh it because the menu is being weird. Um, just to show you how you can get you can get to SOAR at USA from the library's website. Uh, you can also just type in SOAR.USA.edu. Um, but if you wanted to go to the library's website to get to it, there's a, a link to it right here in the main menu of the library's site. Uh, SOAR at USA itself. Uh, looks like this. <laughs> and uh, a couple things that I wanted to show you as a part of, um, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. I'm realizing I can't have two things up at the same time that I want. Um, okay, so <laughs> a couple things I want to show you here um, are different collections that we have. Um, we're, of course, um, want to keep in mind that SOAR at USA is something that's going to be built on over time. Um, it's an ongoing project, right? So um, we had some ideas for initial collections that we wanted to include in SOAR at USA, and that was the student dissertations collection, the faculty and staff research collection, and research day collection. And each of these collections have, uh, or some of these collections have kind of sub collections, um, which we will see in just a minute. But um, these are the collections that we have. If you click on all collections, you see all of the collections and sub-collections. Um, it's got a top 10 downloads where you can see which works have been downloaded most often, most popular papers. And it says it's based on the average number of full text downloads per day since the paper was posted. Um, so it doesn't matter if it's something that was posted yesterday or two weeks ago or a month ago. It's a fair, um, it's a, po it's a downloads per day. Um, so it's fair even for something that's been in, in longer. Uh, so that's a neat feature of it. Um, you can also see recent editions, the 20 most recent editions, things that have been posted most recently. There's an automatically generated paper of the day. This uh, changes automatically every day. We don't program it. We can if we wanted to, um, but we just let it automatically pull a random um, entry from each day. So this is the readership map that I was mentioning. And uh, when you have your own personal account, when you have work that you have posted in SOAR, you'll see a map similar to this just for your work. This one is for the entire repository. Um, and it's just you know cool that you can kind of pull this up and see you know, um, where the readership is coming from. Of course, we're gonna see a lot from St. Augustine, Austin, Miami, and San Marcos, um, but we're seeing others in Japan and there were some in India. Um, and it's it's populating. It's kind of a little show where it shows you one by one. <laughs> um, so you can kind of see that. And right now we have 92 documents in this collection or in, in the repository as a whole. But as I said, we want this to just keep growing over time. And that's that's the purpose of it is to grow and to um, do be an archive for us as an institution. Uh, so I said if we click on all collections, I'm going to show you this. Um, we can expand them all. We've got our three main collections. And if we expand them, you can see under faculty and staff research, we've created some collections that are, are mostly around the disciplines that we have here at the University of St. Augustine. Um, and you would be able to, if, if you had, for example, a, a paper that fell into more than one of these categories, we could have it in both categories. Um, it would kind of be a special situation where you would want to contact SOAR at USA.edu, um, and we could make that possible. Um, but for the most part, what we're asking is that if you are a faculty member in that discipline or if the paper relates to that discipline, that's how you would choose which, um, which of these um, categories, which of these sub-collections to, to submit your work to. The research day, you know, eventually we'll have um, other campuses listed here as well as other campuses get started on, on research days if they choose to do that. And, and of course, additional trimesters listed for, for each research day. We do have, um, at least for the St. Augustine campus, um, we do have an agreement that students who present or people who present at the St. Augustine campus research days starting in the fall, this fall trimester, will, um, will be asked to submit to, to directly post their work upload their, their poster to SOAR at USA. And student dissertations, um, these are, of course, that's self-explanatory. And again, that is going to be a requirement for our programs that have um, students write dissertations. That's going to be a requirement from here on out that those students must 
upload a copy of their finalized and approved dissertation um, to SOAR at USA. Um, of course, we hope that they would want to anyway, because it is there's there's great advantages to them in doing that, but um, it is going to be a requirement. Under authors, this is our list of all the different authors. So if you happen to see your name here and you're like, well, wait a minute, I didn't submit anything. <laughs> there might be a couple of reasons for that. It might be a, a co-author that, that also works at the university might have submitted it. Um, or if you're a St. Augustine campus faculty member and you've worked with a student on a research day poster, then you would also be listed with that research day poster. Um, so that might be why your name is here if you're like, I didn't submit anything. <laughs> um, but this is, you know, a great thing that you can you can pull um, up, go down to my name. So here's my name. And if I wanted to, for example, um, direct somebody to, to the list of my work, um, what I could do here is I could hover over my name. I could do a right click on my mouse and I could copy the link address and that would direct people to uh, whoever clicked on that link would be directed to this list of all of my work in the repository. So this is the part I think that would be particularly useful for things like CAPD, um, where you could click on a faculty member's name and see a list of all of their work that they've uploaded to SOAR at USA. Okay, I just wanted to show the search. So you can also search it. Uh, it's it's kind of designed to be to be browsed, but it's also very searchable. So if I wanted to do a search here for manual therapy, it's going to pull up all the documents within SOAR at USA related to that. To show you what it looks like um, for when you click on it. So let's click on this. This is one of the research day posters. The research day posters are particularly uh, that collection is formatted to to be visually appealing um, which I'll, I can show you an example of but um, so this is this particular one I can kind of see a preview of it um, or I can download um, that PDF you can also share so I can even if, if I didn't want to download I could also kind of look at it and this would be counted as one of the views um, in the readership reports just kind of so you get an idea. Um, like I said, the research day poster collections are designed, formatted specifically to be visually appealing to showcase the posters and the design of the posters. So that's why you have a little thumbnail next to all of those. As opposed to if there is a poster in one of the faculty and staff research collections, it doesn't show up that way because the entire collection has to be formatted that way. Um, so there are, um, posters, posters that are already submitted in this collection and um, it doesn't have that, that thumbnail like the research day ones have. But. Okay, let me switch back over, make sure I addressed everything. Yes, I did. Okay. So what can you submit? Just check, make sure no questions have come up. Okay. Okay, so what can we submit? Um, scholarly articles that are post publication. Um, so, an, an article that you have that's already been accepted and, and published um, in, in a scholarly journal or trade magazine or something like that. Um, depending on publisher restrictions, this might need to be the author's manuscript copy. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more detail, a lot more detail in just a bit. Digital versions of posters presented at conferences, I think that's going to be huge for our repository. I, I know we have a lot of activity with our faculty members and staff members who present at conferences, so I think this is going to be a huge area for us. Um, but you can also do video or audio recordings of presentations you've given at conferences or other events. Published book chapters, again, depending on publisher restrictions, it might not be able to be the final published version. And if there's another kind of content you're wondering about, you know, contact us and let us know, soar at usa.edu. And, um, you know, if it's something we haven't thought of yet, then we can we can uh, consider it and see kind of um, what we can do for, for that kind of content. 
Um, again, I think the most common kind of content we'll have from our faculty and staff here at USA are scholarly articles and poster presentations. I think that's uh, most often what our output is. But we're open to other things than that, of course. So here's where I want to talk about copyright. I mentioned that um, our USA, well, I didn't mention that, but so I mentioned that there that you might not be able to publish the final uh, or share the final published version um, of your of your article or your book chapter. Um, our USA librarians do provide copyright oversight for submissions to SOAR at USA. So what that means um, is you know, basically the question of what version of your publication do you have the right to share? When you as an author agree to have your work published in a scholarly journal or book or other kind of publication, the publisher gives you a copyright release to sign. Typically, these say that you own the copyright, but that you're giving the journal permission to publish and disseminate your work on your behalf. Many of the large publishers stipulate that the final published version of your article as it appears in the journal will not belong to you as the author. Details of any restrictions that apply to your work will be in the copyright agreement that you signed. Um, so to give you an example, I've pulled up a couple of my own copyright agreements here. Uh, so this is an example of a copyright agreement that I signed for um, an article a couple of years ago. The, this is from, oh, actually, sorry, this is the book. Let me do this. This is from the journal article. Um, this was a journal that was published by Taylor and Francis. There's, there's a handful of large publishers that mostly control the scholarly publishing world. Taylor and Francis is one of them. Um, so this is just their, their generic um, publishing agreement and license to publish contract. So, you know, 90% of 99% of the time, this is what you'll get um, if you if you publish with Taylor and Francis. And so there's all sorts of, you know, contracty fine print sorts of things. Um, and one of the sections, Appendix 2, is the schedule of authors' rights. And I highlighted the part, you know, that, that you have the right to post your revised text version of the post print of the article, the article in the form accepted for publication in the Taylor and Francis Journal following the process of peer review um, as an electronic file. Um, but you cannot use the PDF version of the article prepared by Taylor and Francis um, and so that means the one that's formatted with the page numbers from the journal and, and all of that, um, you do not have the permission, um, the ownership to, to share. Um, and you do have to, Taylor and Francis says, you do have to include this note that this is an electronic version of an article published in. And so they, they say you have to include that note if you're going to um, post um, in a repository or something like that. So that's just one example. Um, I also have a book chapter coming out, uh, I think early next year. And so they sent me um, a publication agreement to sign as well. And in this case, um, it's a lot more lenient. Um, you know, it says basically that I can share even the final version of my book chapter. Um, you know, and, and as a matter of fact, if I want to pick a Creative Commons license to apply to my book chapter, I can do so here. And I, and I did do that. Um, so it just depends on who you're publishing with. Um, as I said, there's kind of a handful of journal publishers that kind of control um, scholarly publishing, the scholarly publishing world. And, and they each have their general um, publishing sort of a, of a contract, um, their, their generic one. Um, so we don't really recommend it, but realistically, we know that most people probably sign these sorts of agreements without really reading them, and then you don't really look at them again, right? Um, and so you may not know what restrictions you agreed to. Um, so the best thing to have is a copy of that agreement that you signed that specifically says, you know, these are the rights that you have, this is the version that you can share. But if you don't have that agreement, um, there's a website called Sherpa Romeo and indexes the details of the standard copyright agreements for thousands of publications. Um, of, like I mentioned, this is made easier by the fact that there are a handful of publishers um, that, that mostly are in control of scholarly publishing and, and they each have their standard um, each have their standard license agreement or um, copyright agreement. So let me go, I know that's trippy, let me see. So here's Sherpa Romeo. Um, it's 
fairly easy. You just go to the site and you would type in uh, the, the name of the journal that you're looking for. Oh, because I clicked on that, it went away. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so for example, you can see the ones I've looked at before. <laughs> so for example, let's say physical therapy, the APCA journal. Type that in and it tells me, you know, pretty straightforward. Authors preprint. So the preprint is the copy of your article that you wrote before it went to uh, peer review or refereeing. Um, and so that you can share, you can archive that. The post print is your copy of your article. It's the final draft post refereeing, post peer review. Um, so not the final form, for, final formatted version, but the one that's right before that. And it says you can share that one as well, but you cannot archive the publisher's version PDF with this particular journal. And then it has some general conditions that it lists. Um, and one of those, you know, sometimes they stipulate where you can post and uh, institutional repositories are, are generally um, are generally recognized by that. Although in this case, we can see it says post print in institutional repositories after 12 months embargo. So if you have an article in the journal Physical Therapy and you want to share your post print copy, your author's manuscript copy in uh, SOAR at USA, you can, but you have to put a 12 month embargo on it, um, which means that you can't make the full text openly available until 12 months after the original publication date in the journal. Um, so that's one example. Another example would be Occupational Therapy International. Um, I just chose two random, not random, but um, so in this case, you know, you got green check marks all the way. So you can even even archive the publisher's version PDF um, for if you have a journal in Occupational Therapy International. So a couple other things to look at. You can kind of see um, when it was last updated. And this one was fairly recently, just about a year ago. Um, you know, you can see any notes. Um, this says, you know, prior to January 2017, there might have been a different policy. Um, it might have switched publishers, that sort of a thing. So those are just, you know, things to keep in mind. But this is a great service um, that helps to make this simpler. <laughs> um, that you have some place to go to see what the standard copyright agreement looks like for that particular um, for that particular journal that you've you've published in. Uh, so we do ask that you do some legwork before you submit your work to SOAR at USA, but we're also going to double check. Um, the librarians who kind of manage this are going to be double checking that as well. Um, we're going to probably use Sherpa Romeo. Um, if you do still have a copy of the copyright agreement, you can include it with your submission and additional files. Um, that way we can know 100% certain that it is okay to share this and that you have the permission to do that. Of course, that agreement won't be published. It'll just be for us to look at while we review your submission. Um, not all journals are listed in Sherpa Romeo and, um, you know, always your, the, the agreement that you signed is always the best to look at, but Sherpa Romeo is a good substitute if you don't have that. Um, if we can't confirm one way or another that you can share the work, um, we're just we're just not going to post it um, because we don't want to take that risk of being asked later to take it down or you know a cease and desist letter or something like that. Um, I also wanted to note that agreements for open access articles within traditional journals may be different from that standard copyright agreement that might be on uh, Sherpa Romeo. So what that means is that when you published uh, your article. When it was accepted to the journal, if you opted to do their um, their open access model, um, so so sometimes there's two different choices, right? You can, when it's accepted for publication, you can either choose to pay no money and it's published just as a, a typical pay per pay, you know, journal pay article, or you can pay um, a couple thousand dollars, usually from grant money. Um, to make your article open access, even within that traditionally published journal. So if you've done that open access option within a traditional journal, then your copyright agreement is not going to be the same as the one listed on Sherpa Romeo, but it's probably going to be more lenient 
um, because you've you've paid for that right from the beginning. Okay, so how to submit. Um, this Outlook meeting invite had an instruction sheet. Um, I'm gonna go over it live here in a second. Um, you do wanna use your USA email address when you're creating your account. We're gonna look at mesh terms for keyword. And as I mentioned, attaching a copyright agreement as an additional file when possible. Um, so I'm going to go back out to here. Let me just check your questions real quick. No, okay. Okay. So for actually submitting, sorry. So for actually submitting, there's a couple ways that you can do it. If you're on the home page, you can go right to submit research. And then you'll, it'll have you from that point select which collection you want to uh, submit to. Or if you already know, you can go faculty and staff research here and say, you know, I want to submit to the athletic training collection and then do submit research from here. So it just depends on, on how you want to navigate it. So you click on submit research. At this point, it's going to ask you to log in. If you have not set up an account previously, then you're going to have to sign up and you click on that. It's obviously free. This is the same account you'll use to track your readership of your document. It is something that is unique to SOAR at USA. Um, actually, it's unique to Digital Commons. So if you've posted to other repositories at other institutions that have Digital Commons, you might be able to use the same. Um, the same login as that you use for that one for this one as well and that might be convenient to have all of your readership reports in the same place um, but if you've not done anything before with digital commons you'll just want to sign up for a new account um, we do ask that you use your usa email address since it's a usa repository um, but you know really it's it's your own it's your own account that you're creating um, so i'm going to log in not with my normal account but with this demo account that does not have mine, mine has all the administrator stuff so it looks it looks different <laughs> so i'm going to log in with this account that is um, set to be more like what you would see so once you log in or create your account you see a submission agreement it kind of walks you through the process of submitting it says before you would begin please be sure you have the following items a uh, title for the submission an abstract list of five to 10 keywords. And it says these should be mesh terms whenever possible. And of course you need the file that you're going to be submitting. Um, so, okay, I'll talk about mesh terms when we get to that actual section of the form. Um, so it also has a reminder here about checking your copyright agreement and make sure that you have the right to publish the work in the format that you're trying to submit it in. Uh, it's got a link here to Sherpa Romeo as well. So if you agree to all of this, you click you click this box here and you say continue. Okay, so now is where you start entering the information about your work. So you would do the title here. Note that it's asking for headline style capitalization. So that would mean that all, um, all significant words capitalized of the and to those sorts of words you would not capitalize, but unless it's the first word of the, the title. Um, but everything else you would capitalize and enter that there. Um, under authors, your name's going to be here automatically because you're the one who's logged in. Um, so it's going to have you here automatically. One thing you might check for, though, you might need to edit. You can click here and you might hear it goes. You might need to edit and put University of St. Augustine for Health Sciences as the institution here. Um, so one thing I want to note here is that there might be works that you're submitting that you published or that you worked on before you came to the University of St. Augustine. So the work itself, the article itself, might have you affiliated with a different institution. And that's fine. That's not a big deal. Um, and, and that'll still obviously be reflected in the document itself. But we'd still ask you to put University of St. Augustine for Health Sciences here um, as your institution within this this collection uh, again when somebody opens the full text they'll still see your previous affiliation um, but since again since it's a usa uh, repository we just ask that this always be university of st augustine for health sciences 
Uh, if you have co-authors, you would uh, click this plus button and add them. If it's a USA co-author, you might search for them first. So let's say I wrote this article with Eric Dakotis. Uh, so he's already in here. So I would just select that um, in order to bring it up. OK, so now that's in. And then that will make sure that it connects to the work that he's already submitted to this, um, to this repository. Um, if it's a non-USA co-author, you can just add them from scratch. Um, you do not have to put the email. I think that's an important point. If you do put the email, um, they, they might get an email inviting them to create their own account on SOAR at USA, which they can, and then they can log in to see readership reports and that sort of a thing. But if you don't want to do that for whatever reason, you don't need to fill in the email field. Just put their first, middle, last, however it is on the actual the actual um, work. Um, and if they have an affiliating affiliation uh, institution, you can put that here as well. Um, also, if it's a corporate co-author, you can put that as well and then just have essentially the institution listed. Document type. So in our faculty and staff research collections, we have all different document types together in the same collection or say, same sub collections. They're organized by discipline rather than by article or by um, document type. So article is one. Uh, a poster would be a conference proceeding, um, but whatever best fits what you're submitting. The publication date. You don't again. You don't need to fill in all of these things. Just fill in the information that you have. Um, so if it was published in a January 2018 issue of a journal, you could put January and you can put 2018. Um, you don't need to have a day. You don't need to have a season. But let's say it was published in the summer 2018 um, issue of a journal. So then instead of putting a year or a month, you would put summer and get rid of this and you'd have summer 2018. So however, it's just made to be flexible so that it works for you. The embargo period, so you're rarely going to use this. Um, we were looking before at physical therapy on Sherpa Romeo, and it said, you know, that if if you were to post in an institutional repository, you couldn't, it wouldn't be able, there's a 12-month embargo, right, that you you agreed to when you signed your copyright um, agreement. So in that case, you would set this to be um, one year from when it was published in that journal. However, in most cases, there is not going to be an embargo period. That's, uh, that's, it's rather rare for them to require an embargo period. And if there is no embargo period, um, you would just put today's date here. So you just put, okay, today is September, today is like 18th, 2018. So that means it can immediately be available. An embargo, um, think of like a trade embargo, it's blocked, right? So this means that the full text of this document will be blocked until this date. So if it's today's date, that means it doesn't get blocked at all. Another useful thing that this embargo period can be used for is let's say that you are presenting a poster at a, at a conference and you want to, so what you could do is you could submit the poster, the digital version of your poster before the conference, but you could set the embargo period date to be the day that you are presenting. So it's, already set up, it's in SOAR at USA, but nobody can actually see it until the day that you're presenting it. Um, it'll automatically happen, right? So you don't have to remember to go in and switch it on or anything. It automatically becomes available on that date. Um, I think that's an also, also a good way to have ahead of time a URL that you can share with people at the conference. So, you know, poster sessions at conferences, you know, everyone goes around taking pictures of the posters that are interesting to them. Um, so what I've done before is I've had a URL on like a business card, like the title of my presentation and my name and my email address, and then a, a URL where they can view the presentation later, um, view the poster later. And if you can kind of just hand those out to the attendees um, that are interested in your poster, and that way they don't feel pressured to um, take in everything that they can because this is their only chance to take in your poster. Um, so this is a good use. The SOAR is a good way to do that as well. You can have a URL specific to your poster, and you know the URL ahead of time, but it's not actually live until the day that you present. Okay, keywords. So this is where we're asking to have MESH keywords. MESH are medical subject headings, um, primarily used with Medline. PubMed, um, which is the National Institute of Health and National Library of Medicine. It's a controlled vocabulary 
um, that's used heavily throughout health sciences and medical um, research. So um, we're asking for MeSH subject headings um, for a couple of re reasons. Um, the first is for conformity. Um, our library catalog is, uses MeSH keywords um, as well as, of course, PubMed and things like that. So uh, it, it's a conformity thing, um, makes it easier to, for things to be grouped together that are related, that sort of a thing. Um, so then your question might be, well, how do I know what, what is a MeSH keyword versus just a keyword I made up in my head um, that's related to my, my project? Um, so the best way to do that is if you just go, you can just type in PubMed.com and it'll take you automatically to this page. And then you click on Mesh Database. So this is essentially a giant thesaurus or a giant, um, yeah, thesaurus, exactly what it is, um, of all of the Mesh terms, all of the medical subject heading terms. So for example, um, my article is maybe on, um, you know, physical therapy, a, a specific physical therapy intervention. So one of my keywords that I have in my head might be, okay, I want physical therapy to be one of my keywords. So I can type in here, physical therapy, and it's going to show me the mesh terms, the official mesh terms that have to do with physical therapy. So for physical therapy, the two primary ones are physical therapy modalities and physical therapy specialty. And it's handy, you can read the definition to see which one is the best fit. Um, in general here, physical therapy modalities has to, you would use that when you're talking about the things that physical therapists do, the interventions that they use. Um, whereas you would use physical therapy specialty if you're talking about physical therapy as a profession or, um, yeah, if you're talking about physical therapy as a profession or, you know, if you're talking about um, the, the, the discipline rather than the interventions, if that makes sense. So that, so this would be your MeSH term, physical therapy modality. So you could copy that and you could paste it in your keywords. Um, so we're asking for five to 10 keywords, but of course that depends on um, what your article's about or what your work is about. Um, sometimes you won't find matches in MeSH, uh, particularly if you, um, if it's something having more to do with teaching or learning or the education field, MeSH is obviously medical subject heading, so not everything will be represented. If you need help with this step, please reach out to us. We're more than happy to help with it. Um, if you are submitting an article that has been indexed in PubMed, um, more than likely this has already been done for you. Some uh, indexer who works for the National Institute of Health has already assigned your article mesh subject headings, mesh terms. So this is an example. This is one of the works that was submitted um, from some of our faculty members on the Austin campus. And if you if your article is indexed in PubMed, you can just pull up the PubMed record for your article. Click here where it says publication type mesh terms. And here's your list of mesh terms that have been assigned to your article. Um, I would say for our repository, only do the ones that have the asterisks next to it. Those ones are what's called major subject headings or the, the, the topics that, that are the most important topics for this, um, the, the major topics in this article. So then you can just copy and paste these without the asterisks into your keyword section here. Um, if it's a brand new, like if it was just published and just put on PubMed, you know, a month ago or something, um, it might not have mesh terms assigned to it yet. They're actual human being indexers who their job is to look at PubMed's um, things that are indexed in PubMed and assign them mesh terms. Um, so there's backlog. And so um, you might not have mesh terms if it's a newer published article. But, um, nice shortcut to keep in mind if, if your work is indexed in PubMed already. So that's all we're asking for with the mesh. And again, if you need help, if that seems intimidating, um, you know, reach out to us. We're more than happy to do that. And also, once you submit, that's one of the things that is on our checklist to look at before we, um, before we post your submission. So before your submission is actually posted, we go through and check all of these things and make sure everything looks how it should. <clears throat> so that's one of the things that we do check. So disciplines, so this will be, um, depending on the collection that you're submitting to, there'll be at least one thing that's already filled in for you. Um, 
for the discipline, but you can find more. If uh, we, we wouldn't want, I think, more than three-ish disciplines here, um, unless it was really a, a very multidisciplinary project. Um, but you can find a few more if you want to. Obviously, the medicine and health sciences section is going to have um, mostly what we're going to be using here at USA. Um, but if, if it's more education related, there's also um, an education um, under social and behavioral sciences somewhere. It's in there somewhere. Oh, education has its own thing. There it is. So if it's education related, you can pull from there. Uh, like I said, there's going to be at least one that's already automatically filled in here, um, but you can add more. The abstract is just a simple copy and paste. You probably already have an abstract for your work. Um, if you don't already have an abstract for your work, you can just write a brief description. Um, a lot of the research day posters from the students, they didn't have an abstract, but all of them had a purpose statement. The purpose of this poster is, and so we just copied those, the, that one sentence um, purpose statement to put here for the abstract. The abstract helps people find your work. Uh, the keyword matching and things like that when searching, it matches to your abstract. So it's one of the, the kind of rich text areas, um, fields where you can find matches to, or somebody's search can find matches, the keywords can find matches. The comments, so this is comments to actually be posted with your document. So this wouldn't be, you know, hey, Julie, I'm submitting this to you, thanks, you know, or something like that. This would be comments that actually should be um, displayed with your submission. So remember when we were looking at my Taylor and Francis um, journal article copyright form and it said you have to include this statement using these words, this would be a great place to put that, um, to put that statement. Um, another place, uh, so research poster that you've presented at a conference or another sort of meeting, you could give that information here. You can say, this is a poster presentation that was presented at the 2018 APTA meeting in wherever, wherever, you know, that sort of a thing. Um, so if you need guidelines on what to put for that, um, let us know. There's probably examples already um, within the repository from other people's submissions that you can look at, but this would just be any additional information that you want to provide about your work that isn't, that you haven't already shared about it, essentially. The recommended citation, this is optional. Um, Digital Commons automatically generates a recommended citation. They're not very good, um, but it does automatically generate one. Um, I would recommend putting something else here if, if, you're, if, it's a, it's, if it's been published in a journal, if this is an article that's been published in a journal. What I would suggest putting here is the citation of the final published version of the article. Um, and in whichever, you know, whether you use APA or AMA or, or what have you, that's up to you. But um, that's what I would recommend putting here if it's something that's been published in a journal previously. So now you can upload your file. Most likely you're going to be uploading file from your computer. So you click that top radio button, choose file, find it in wherever it's saved on your computer um, and upload it. Um, you might. Um, need to link out to a file on a remote site. This would be, for example, if your article is already available open access through the journal publisher, but for some reason we're not sure that you can actually share that again yourself. Um, so to play it safe, you might want to just link out to the file on the publisher's site. The downside to that, of course, is that it's not as permanent necessarily. Um, if that journal goes out of business, you know, whatever, um, that it might not remain available on their site, whereas the PDF um, would remain available on our source site. So if you have additional files, this is where you can submit um, copyright agreements if you have them for us to double check that, that everything's good. Um, you can click this and when you hit submit, it'll take you to another screen where you can upload those additional files. Um, depending on what the additional files are, they'll either be, be posted with your art or with your work or they won't. Um, obviously, a copyright agreement would not be published. But let's say, for example, it was um, uh, some, some data that went along with an article or something like that, a data file, then you might want that also to be published along with your document. So it could be either either it's kind of a, a catch all for additional files. You know, we can choose which ones are shared and which ones are not shared publicly. 
So of course, then you hit submit when you're done. And that um, if you haven't, if you clicked additional files, that'll then take you to upload those additional files. If you have not clicked additional files, then you'll just you'll get a message saying, you know, hold on a minute, we're submitting it, and then it'll uh, give you a confirmation when it's been submitted. Um, and then once you submit it, we'll look at it. We get a notification in the library um, about it, and we'll go and look at it, um, correct anything that needs correcting. If we have questions, we'll reach out to you. Um, for example, if you forgot to attach a document or, um, you know, there's some other question about it, we'll, we might get in contact with you to get more information. Um, but once we're satisfied that everything is good, everything's as it should be, then um, we'll post it and have it go live and you'll get a confirmation email automatically when that happens. So that's the submission process. Um, really, because I had to, because the way I explained it, it seems like it takes a long time, but it really doesn't. <laughs> it's just because I was explaining each part of it. Okay, let's jump back over here. We're almost done. Just wanted to mention um, Eric Robinson, who is um, currently the San Marcos campus librarian sort of, um, he is, uh, as of October 1st, he's going to move into a new role being the distance learning librarian um, with a focus on scholarly communication. So part of that will be that he will be the manager, the main person managing SOAR at USA. So I'll kind of hand that baton over to him um, just to, for him to manage SOAR at USA. But the best place to contact, if you have any questions, whatever, having to do specifically with SOAR, is to email soar at usa.edu, and that's a shared inbox. Um, Eric has it, I have it as well, so um, we can make sure to get your question answered um, if you email soar at usa.edu. He's also gonna be managing, um, focusing on other sorts of scholarly communication projects and education for all faculty and students. So more information about what open access is, um, how to detect a predatory journal, you know, things like that. Um, we've got a lot of great plans for, for this, this new position. So next, of course, we're focusing on content as our biggest next step. Um, we'll never stop adding new content to SOAR at USA, right? That's the point of it. But um, we, we do want to, you know, get the momentum going. We want people to think about SOAR and we want it to be fresh in your minds. And we know that that you're busy as, as faculty members and, and staff members of the university, that you're busy and, uh, you know, it's right at the beginning of the semester now and, you know, that sort of a thing. But we want this to be fresh in your mind. We want it to be at the top of your mind when you're publishing, um, that this is a, a natural next step, is that you would, you know, oh, I've been accepted to this journal. Oh, here's my postprint. Okay, now let me share it um, on SOAR. So, or I presented that this, I'm presenting at this conference, this poster, um, let me share it on SOAR. We want this to be, um, you know, just a part of your routine. Um, it's voluntary right now for faculty and staff to contribute. You know, we, we don't have any authority to, to make anybody um, contribute, but there's, there's so many benefits to doing so. Um, we hope that you'll see the value in submitting your work and making it available to a wider audience and having an, a stable place to archive it. So submit, submit away. <laughs> Any past research that you've done, you can submit that immediately. And then as you have more research output, you know, consider submitting that to SOAR as well. Um, we also want to talk more about integrating SOAR at USA into the curriculum, uh, particularly having to do with student work. You know, I mentioned that we're working with some of the post-professional programs to have student dissertations included in SOAR, as well as working with Research Day events. Um, if you have anything to do with Research Day, um, getting Research Day going or something like that on one of our other campuses or digitally uh, for post-professional or anything like that, you know, bring us into the conversation. We'd love to be a part of that conversation and talk about how that student work can go farther um, by being posted to SOAR. Um, also, you know, if there's more, um, if, if there's, you know, a capstone project in the program that you teach in um, or, or something like that, that might be of publication quality, you can consider having students upload those final projects to SOAR at USA, much like a dissertation. Um, or you might be concerned that all the capstone projects are not necessarily publication quality. Um, then maybe we can develop some sort of a nomination system. So it's, it's like an honor if a student is asked to, to upload their work 
their capstone project to soar, that that's an honor for them. Um, that means they're the best of the best um, for, for that capstone project. So it doesn't necessarily have to be all or nothing. We can arrange something that's kind of in between. Um, and and you know, that's a good thing for the students too. then. Again, it's an honor and it's something that they can have a unique link to that to put on their resumes to show potential employers. Um, and finally, let's let's work together to plan publishing projects. Um, Eric Robinson, you know, who I mentioned earlier, is is working on establishing a student run peer reviewed journal through SOAR at USA. Um, similar to how other institutions might have a student run newspaper, we're going to have a student run scholarly journal. Um, it's going to be a great learning experience for students to participate, as well as an opportunity for students to get their work published in a peer reviewed journal. So that's one example. Um, it's very early stages of that project right now. Um, and it's going to start small and then hopefully grow over time. Um, but we want to hear other ideas. What ideas do you have? Um, it doesn't have to be something that's only for our students. It could be something that um, you publish that's kind of sponsored by USA and, and distributed through SOAR and done through SOAR, but that anybody can submit to. Your colleagues you know, at, at other institutions and, and around the world can submit to. So any, anything like that, um, we'd love to have uh, you can test that with us and we can train you to use the software and provide additional support that you need, but it really would be your project. Um, likewise, if you've been considering writing a scholarly book, um, perhaps based on a course note packet or course guide, or maybe as an open educational resource or open textbook to go along with a course that you teach, um, not necessarily, it could be any sort of book project, you can publish it through SOAR at USA. Um, there would be no cost and you retain all the copyright ownership um, but of course, SOAR is dedicated to being an open access repository. So that means that if you published a book through SOAR, it would be an open access book. It wouldn't be something you could charge um, a, a fee for. Okay, so that's everything. Again, the contact is SOAR at USA.edu. And I'm going to, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna go over to see what questions we might have. Um, Julie, thanks so much for the presentation. That was awesome. Um, my question has to do with our contributing faculty. Can they contribute as well? And you may have said that, and I just missed it. Absolutely, yeah. Really, it's it's, it's for our our students, faculty, staff. Um, we would even, you know, if an alumni reached out to us and said, "Hey, can we publish in this?" We would even we would even uh, you know consider that. So for sure, it's just a it's a place for uh, anybody who's affiliated with USA to be able to showcase their work. Awesome. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Jane. I have a question about the student project area. What I'd okay. really like to see is the where it says dissertations, if we could change that title and just add on to it and scholarly projects for our DMP students in particular who are not earning a PhD, therefore they don't have a dissertation they will have a project and, and it will be very meaningful and meaningful to people who might be searching the internet and it would be great if they could pop up and our clinicians could find that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I definitely would be interested in talking more about that. Um, rather than changing that specific collection, what we would probably do instead is create kind of a, a larger uh, collection almost that's called student work or student projects and then have dissertations and as one, leave that as it is, and then have a second collection that's you know DNP projects specifically. So those three collections that are up there now, that's not the limit, right? We can do as many as different kinds that we want to. Um, so I would I would say we would probably even create its it as its own collection specifically for DNP projects. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another one for capstone projects. We have so many different types of final projects. Um, mm -hmm. So if we can encompass that, um, you know, that verbiage to collect them all. That's the great thing about being, that's why I'm, I'm really suggesting creating new collections for when we have those things available. So some of um, some of it is that, that we don't know yet what kind of collections we want to have. So we will create those as we go along, create them as we need them. Um, so student dissertations does fit what's in student dissertations right now. Um, but if we have DMP projects, like I said, that can be a new collection. Um, whatever, you know, another discipline that has its own kind and formats 
that can be its own thing. And, and one of the another good things about doing that is that these collections um, can be specific to the format. Um, like I mentioned with the research day posters, how those are that collection is formatted to be visually appealing. Um, so if you have a mixture of dissertations and posters and other sorts of projects all together, you can't be as you maybe can't showcase them as well as if it was its own collection designed to showcase that type of project. Julie, it's Karen again. Um, I'm really excited about the Research Day posters because that started from a very um, small collection <laughs> to multiple. And the post-professional OTD students aren't required to participate in Research Day anymore. And we're looking at that virtual um, opportunity to disseminate their information. So I like to um, talk to you more about this virtual Definitely. you know poster dissemination and I'll send Jennifer Crowder your way absolutely yeah send it to soar at usa.edu um, okay. so we can kind of keep all of those sorts of things together but um, it even has the capability where you can request kind of submissions through soar so rather than um, we can sort of create it as, as an event for example, like if you wanted to have a digital uh, a digital poster session, um, we can do that. We don't have an example of that yet on our site because it hasn't happened yet, but it would be kind of an event and then they could submit their posters to that event and um, get approval, you know, and, you know, you or, or whoever else you designate could be the ones who look at those um, as they come in. So there's lots of lots of uh, potential there for sure. And it's soar at usa.edu, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? If you think of any later, soar at usa.edu is the main contact for the repository. And again, that's, um, you know, I see those once. Um, once Eric kind of uh, hand that baton over to Eric, he'll see them as well. So it's just, we wanted a, a constant email. So you don't have to say, well, who do I need to talk to about this? If it's SOAR related, send it to SOAR at USA.edu. And that way it's a little easier for everybody to, to remember. So thank you so much for your, um, your questions and for your attendance today. And uh, I'm really excited about this and I hope that you are too, and that we can work together on making this resource the best it can be for our university. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Julie. Thanks, Julie. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.